Whoa, guys, welcome back to the studio, Ryan, aka Bloodshot Airbrushing, and we are here for a tutorial. Now, for this one, guys, you may have had some glimpses here and there in the other videos of the other parts, but uh, that was just a teaser to get you to this point right here, guys, and beginners, advanced, wherever you are in your level of airbrushing. I'm sure you're going to pick up a trick or two along the way in this series. This is going to be video number one. And we're going to tackle my process on how I do start to finish. I hope you guys are excited for this one. This is a big one for me. It's going to be a lot of work. And you guys are going to get a lot of information. So... I'm going to pretty much give you the lowdown on how I operate from start to finish. And uh, for those of you, I know a couple of you guys have been asking how to run your own business. I'm hoping some of the stuff is going to help you. For others who are just looking to airbrush and looking to get a little bit better in your skills, well, I think you're going to learn something too. All right, guys. With that being said, check it out. Alright guys, so today we're going to start talking a little bit of the process on what I go through dealing with clients who come in who have their own ideas and we got to get that idea spewed onto a motorcycle for the most part or whatever they want to have done. So in this case guys, my particular client for this one, um, he came to me with a few images and this is always great guys, if you are working for somebody else Try and get inside their brain is a very difficult thing. So the more images they can bring to your door saying, I like this, I like this, but I don't like that. Uh, I love this color, not that color, this color. You know, the more information you can get. And it's very hard to talk art without having something to visualize, guys. So these are some of the images that he has brought in. Now, I'm sure you saw the other parts, guys, so I'm sure you know where we're going with this. Alright, so we brought the Grim Reaper, right? That's one of them. This one's going to come into play a little bit more on the gas tank. Uh, this might be recognizable from the air cleaner cover. And some snakes. He also brought me this as a reference, which might be recognizable as the rear fender. Now, again, sometimes, guys, I am told that this is exactly what they want, and I need to come up with my own sort of facsimile, my own version of, um, which is what you saw in the case of the air cleaner cover, um, the eye for the side of the bike case. Okay, so these were all ideas that were discussed as he was in my studio. And we're snowballing, I'm jotting stuff down, writing it down, doing quick little sketches. You know what? Hold on right there. Alright guys, my trusty Bible. This is where I keep down all my information for all my jobs, all my customers. Um, when my client comes to my shop and he brings me his ideas, I start jotting information down, I start doodling like a madman. And as you guys can see, it's not a lot of detail. It's just some information. Green eyes for the snake. Red eyes for the guy. Remove Yamaha logos. <laughs> so it's just some information and some quick sketches just so I know and the customer knows that I know that I've got a good idea of what he wants represented on his bike. Now, it's a constant evolution. Some of these ideas change. Originally, we had a different idea for the back fender, and we kind of evolved that into something a little different. But uh, this is how it works, man. It's a constant evolution, guys. That's it. That's all. I, we spent maybe 20 minutes, and we just kind of figured out what we were going to do on each part. Now, after that was accomplished, he left the studio, and that's when my work begins, guys. So I go... Onto the good old world of Google, and I start doing some searches. Some of the reference he brought me, um, well, that's not a Cobra, all right? So I need a Cobra in that sort of same position. So I started looking at pictures of Cobras. Um, I wanted to paint a black Cobra, so I started getting reference for black snakes. 
and you start pulling up all kinds of different reference. Um, when it comes to skulls and reapers, guys, I've drawn enough of them over my almost two and a half decades of doing this that I have a skull in the background for quick reference if I need it, but typically I can pretty much pen those guys out pretty quickly. And when any of you guys are interested, we will do a beginner series where we're going to tackle the skull, start to finish. Very simple. This is a little bit more advanced, um, but this will be the skull, will be something you guys can tackle easily on your own. I might even do a PDF that you guys can download of a, of a skull that I've drawn. We'll see. We'll see how that all turns out. Again, I'm new to this whole technological world, so I'm just doing my best. <laughs> As we get along here, we'll make something happen for you guys. Alright, back to work. So, all that being said, once you've got your information, once you've got your images, then you are doing some drawings. If you need more detail, put more detail into it. Um, for skulls, I again, I've painted so many of them. <laughs> if it wasn't for skulls, I wouldn't have a job, guys. <laughs> it's so true. So I don't really need to do too much detail on the skulls and the bones. I know how they work. I've done enough of them in my little career. Now, snakes are a little different, guys. I've maybe done them in the same time period maybe half a dozen times. So for those, I definitely wanted more reference more detail even in my drawing so I grabbed some great reference guys high quality high res photos I can zoom those up I can see what's going on um, and from that stage then you start your drawing guys what I typically tend to do is I start light and just keep penciling it darker and darker and darker until you have the form that you're happy with form that you're happy with and then I use just a little piece of tracing paper, guys. I put that over top. And then I start putting in some details. Okay? Details form. All right? Don't spend too much time on this one, slapping all your details on there. There's going to be a lot of erasing form details, guys. And even with this one, it's still not polished, as I would call it. So once you've got that, you can take this guy off your uh, transfer paper. You can slap that into a photocopier and photocopy that. And then you've got something that you can work with and you can put even greater detail into it. All right, guys, from this stage, you grab the size that you need. Photocopy a few sizes, figure out where it's going to be placed on your project and once you have your size, you are ready to start stenciling. And stencils, guys, for just my skull and cloak, I've got one stencil, two stencils, three stencils. So keep that in mind. Um, I tend to have a stencil for every layer. If there is something that's overlapping something else, I tend to put those in individual stencils, colors. If I've got red eyes, I'll typically cut those out of one stencil. If there's something else red in the project on the same area, I'll cut that out as well. Um, but that's kind of how I roll. So here's another one. Great example. I've got hands going behind the pole and hands going above it. So I've cut the back half out of there, cut the front half out of there. Okay guys, got a hand holding a playing card. So that hand got cut. Here the playing card got cut. Body of the snake, all right? And then we've got the actual staff itself. So these are just your layer stencils and then I always like to do a detail stencil where I am just cutting out my darks. And this is to map everything out. Um, I'd much rather be precise with my exact knife on top of my pencil lines and get precise lines and map it out that way than trying to freehand and realizing that, you know, you spent a couple hours and it may not be exactly where you wanted it. And you gotta start again. So 
any mistakes that have been made, guys, for the mapping out for the form of this subject has all been done. I am happy I'm not making any other changes. Basically, now I'm just applying paint, three dimensions, shades, and highlights, and then a little bit of color. So, let's cut some stencils, guys. I know a lot of you guys have been waiting. I know a lot of you guys have been asking. So let's get down here and I'm gonna show you how I cut this snake as a stencil. Now, this is intense, guys. This is an intense little stencil because I'm cutting out scales. I wanna know where my main scales are. I didn't spend all that time drawing for nothing, guys. So, let's get on in here. You can check it out. All right, guys, and first things first, photocopy it so you have multiple layers. Um, for this one, I took three photocopiers, and guys, I always save the original in case I need to go back and make more copies. Now, if I've sized it, if I've brought it up 10%, 25%, brought it down 75%, I always write that on the original because you never know when you may need that again. So, little tip for the brain box, guys, and now we are just going to get in with this. We are going to cut it out. And uh, I don't know that there's much of a real trick to the whole stenciling, cutting process. Definitely try to uh, hold down your paper with the opposite finger. Uh, it stops that paper from sliding around on you. It stops it from tearing and ripping. And what I'm going to do, guys, is I'm going to cut out a complete outline of this Cobra. And that's going to give me actually two stencils. So that will give me an outline of the snake. And I will use the interior stencil, what just got cut out. What I tend to refer to as the positive part of the stencil. What is left behind the hole would be the negative part of the stencil. So once I get that all cut, guys, the positive part actually becomes my Darks. So what I do is I use that snake and I start cutting out all my little dark details so it can all get mapped out and then it follows the exact same line as the outline for whatever color I've sprayed, usually white, to build it up and uh, make it happen. Now, what you see me do here, guys, I just kind of stab it with my exact knife and pull up. And the reason why I do that is because it shows me right away if there's any corners that are hanging up. And if they are, it just releases off that blade without pulling and ripping your edges. That's the last thing you wanna do is rip it. We do stencil so we can have nice clean edges. And here guys, I wasn't quite happy with the way the tongue came out. It was a little chunky. On one side, he had a fat tongue, so just a little bit of masking tape, guys, and recut that to where you're happy with it. You're going to want to catch and correct your mistakes here, guys. Yeah, so be aware. You don't want to come back later on the project and realize, oh, man, that stencil wasn't right. Oh, I should have corrected. Oh, man, too late. Uh, I guess he's got a fat tongue now. Uh, maybe he got stung by a bee. It's a possibility. <laughs> All right, guys. So now that I've got that cut, I am going on to my layers. And realistically for this one, the only real layers I have is the inside of the mouth, which has a little bit of a red tone. And the eyeballs, which will be kind of a yellowy, glowy, sort of deep kind of green. And uh, the body of the snake as well. Um... It's going to have a bit of a green tone to the scales. Um, the belly of the snake, however, is going to have just a hint of yellow. And again, these are pretty subtle tones, so I'm just going to freehand that. I'm not going to worry about cutting a stencil. And uh, this is it. This is the stencil for the interior of the mouth. Now, as you see, I tried to tap it up with that blade, and it was catching. So... Rather than pulling with your fingers and be like, oh, I can just pull that corner off and go tear. And you're like, oh, no. No, just, like I say, this this little trick. Tapping it with the blade 
and then pulling it up with the blade when it gets hitched it just it releases it just falls off that blade nothing gets ripped nothing gets ripped and you proceed with a clean stencil here we go again man same area that tongue is a pretty tight cut and I wasn't quite happy with the way that line was coming through so a little bit of masking tape guys and that's how I do <laughs> all right and as you probably guessed on to layer three which is by far the easiest it's an eyeball and now that I'm actually voicing over this and looking back on that stencil, I'm going to go back and I'm going to cut out those fangs as well out of that same layer that the eyeball was cut out of. I think having them nice and bright and predominantly white will be beneficial. So I'm going to go do that right now. Nah, I'm just kidding. I'll do that when I'm done. All right, guys. Now is... Well... Now is the time for a new blade. <laughs> and uh, it's good to note when you start to feel that your paper is being ripped rather than a nice smooth cut, change up that blade for sure. Don't try to soldier on through that, guys. You'll just create yourself a nightmare. New blades. Uh, not much of a real hack. It's not really going to save you much money in the short term. But definitely in the long term, guys, if you're going to be doing this, even as a hobby, man, I recommend buying the 100 packs of X-Acto Blades, guys. Buying in bulk. You know the drill, man. You always save when you buy in bulk. I think it almost cuts the price in half. Um, usually they sell them in little packs of 10, and that could be... Well, I can't, I mean, dollar amounts really don't make sense if you're not in the same, if you're not local. So I don't know if I should give you dollar amounts, but I'm telling you, buy bulk and you will save a ton. And uh, then you're not so worried, man. You got five blades and you tend to nurse them. <laughs> you baby those blades till there's nothing left. Um, ah, with well, that being said, maybe there is a hack here. I have seen and I have heard of people sharpening X-Acto blades. Man, if you're on a budget, <laughs> there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, when I've got a 100-pack, guys, I pretty much use one blade for every project. Sometimes I will use a couple blades, depending on how many stencils I need to cut or how many lines I need to cut on the actual project. Sometimes you're doing a hot rod-style flame, and that's a lot of lines to cut. But uh, this is uh, the interior of the mouth, just getting my darks in, guys, and... As this is a video about stencil guys let's talk a little bit about it stencils versus freehand so there are a lot of guys that consider freehand you just going in with your airbrush mapping out your lines tightening it up tightening it up tightening it up tightening it up until you're done um, airbrush only there are guys that believe freehand is where you pencil in your lines um, and then you freehand your airbrush over top of that um, there are others that believe that well, like me, true freehand is finger painting, guys, with your own blood. Because otherwise, you're using tools. So there you have it. It would seem that freehand is minimizing the amount of tools you can use. And stenciling, guys, is just another tool. It's a tool to help map out your structure. It's a tool to help so that you know where everything is. It's a tool to help define some nice hard edges. And guys, in my line of work, this really is a tool to help me speed up my process. But there you have it, guys. That's my two cents. And that is the interior of the mouth. All of my darks laid out. And now... I'm on scale duty, so all I am doing is cutting the little corners where those scales all join. And that's going to show me, once it's all said and done, <laughs> exactly where every scale that I've drawn is supposed to be. So... <laughs>
as I go through and cut out a couple dozen more of these little dudes. And we're going to speed up the process. Now, once you see me cut out the first dozen, I think you get the gist for the remaining 40 <laughs> some odd of these. Yeah. Anyways, guys. Here I am cutting in the nostrils and some of the little bit of darker details around the nose area and uh, I guess the forehead of this uh, little serpent. And then guys finishing up some of the details around the eye where I need to map it out. And, and this would be a good time to state the importance of not making too many changes guys if your eyeball is where it is on one stencil don't start changing it on one and trying to uh overcompensate for the rest this is why we use one drawing and photocopy it multiple times guys so that every layer that you put on top of the next registers and so that's pretty good for the scales guys i think one or two more down the back of the head here and then we're gonna start pushing for more of our details and this is it this is the reason why i do stencils this maps out and keeps all my details cohesive it is the same throughout. I can go back in at any point, guys, using my stencil, using the appropriate color or tone, and just re-register anything that I need. If uh, I'm going in and I'm blending out some of my lines, I blended out too far, well, guys, you still have your stencil, so you go back to the good old cut photocopy regular loose leaf nothing special and you re-register those lines guys carefully carefully guys uh the last thing you want to do is get double lines that kind of defeats the purpose and it's a step backwards so take your time guys take the time to blow off all of your little uh shards of paper that you left behind if you get too many of them underneath your stencil it can actually cause your blade to uh skip while you're cutting it catches that piece of paper underneath and it pulls not where you want it to be but where that piece of paper underneath <laughs> directs it to go guys and so here is another one of my little tricks that i shall bestoweth upon you as you may have noticed for these super tight lines in the belly of this snake I'm only cutting one line how are you gonna get a stencil of that Ryan well you're not early but check it flip her over and now rather than having all that scribbling and all that pencil and all that other stuff on the top which makes it kind of hard to see where your cut was now there's no static man you know exactly where that line is and now you can cut just a sliver just the smallest sliver out and this maps out some very beautiful lines guys and a little trick guys flip her over you might have noticed me throughout i flip over the stencil quite a bit i use this side as a way to kind of gauge to see how it's coming along because there's no pencil on this side right if I can see the snake coming through on this side and I know I'm doing something right <laughs> you know what I'm saying guys and here's the real trick guys at the end of the day you use stencils but you want to make it look like you didn't use any at all and We'll tackle this in one of the next videos, guys, blending out these lines that the stencil gives you. But this is what I do, guys. Every project, I, I make my own stencils, guys. I will file those away at the end of the project. And heaven forbid that any of these bikes get laid down. Guys, I need to do any touch-ups. My life is so much easier having these stencils on file I can go back and I can bring them and I can give that client maybe the colors might be a little bit off some of the freehand work but the structure is identical all right guys and with that being said I never use the same stencil twice unless it's for that particular client 
or if that particular client gives me the go ahead to use it on say his wife's project or maybe a buddy I don't know but he's got the ultimate say this is everything I do guys this is a one-of-a-kind industry I wouldn't make it if I reused and reused and reused that's not what I'm all about everything I do is a one-of-a-kind and yes it takes time <laughs> <laughs> Good work always does, guys, and I am okay with that. I am a go-with-the-flow kind of guy, and if that flow happens to be a little slow, that ain't gonna phase me much, guys. I've said it before, and I will say it again. It ain't so much about how you get there as it is about the final results, guys. Now, I'm not going to go ahead and cut every scale. I got other ways to achieve that, but that's it. That's up. Rock on. Oh, that's just, just, get, get, okay. <clears throat> Hang loose. Rock on. Thumbs up. And a squirmy little pinky. Oh, man. <laughs> All right, guys, and that's this one. Believe me, there's plenty more to come, so this is just a little taste. Um, in the next video, we'll get into doing some actual laydown of the stencils. Um, this one's going to be a little bit different because we're working over a metallic base, but a lot to learn, guys, so stick around for that, and um, if you have any questions... Be sure to hit me up, drop me a line, I'll be sure to answer them in time, and guys, as always, like, follow, subscribe, thanks for coming along for the ride. Cheers! And if you haven't already checked out my other beginners videos and airbrushing hacks and project tutorials, be sure to check those out. Alright guys, cheers!